Week 11 of the semester has arrived. Autumn is in the air as the semester approaches its end. Our Halloween plans may not be final yet, but our plan for the final should be. There are no good shortcuts. We have to synthesize our materials as we go along. These materials include our takeaways, but much more, too. Speaking of takeaway, agencies may rulemake only by following APA Section 553 Notice and Comment Procedures, unless the statute says otherwise. In exercising formal APA Section 556-557 adjudicatory powers, agencies may develop new doctrines in common law style. When an agency creates law via the adjudicative route, it has the power to make a reversal of doctrine apply to the case before it, as well as to future cases. Agencies with both rulemaking and adjudicatory powers have discretion to choose which to use to make doctrine. Agencies may be found to abuse that discretion if they penalize conduct expressly approved by prior doctrine. Mere detrimental reliance does not constitute a penalty, though a fine does. Agencies having enforcement power have broad discretion to pick and choose their targets. Agencies must either publish rules or forego enforcing them, fines or penalties, against parties without actual notice. This applies even to rules that need not be promulgated by notice and comment. We now take a closer look at rulemaking. One of the distinctive aspects of notice and comment rulemaking under the APA is that it is meant to involve a significant degree of public participation. The APA does this for us. The Constitution's Due Process Clause does not. Recall our bimetallic case. The Constitution does not require that all public acts be done in town meeting or an assembly of the whole. Congress, in enacting the APA, wanted to open things up to the public, but only to a certain degree. Being clear about the public's procedural rights in rulemaking is central to understanding what is distinctive about administrative law. But to be clear about it, we need to bear in mind that the APA embodies not one, but two procedural models for rulemaking. Let's look again at our big picture. Look in the rulemaking column and take note of the fact that there are two models of procedural requirement. The less formal of the two is notice and comment rulemaking governed by APA section 553. The more formal is often referred to as on-the-record rulemaking, which follows Section 556-557 trial-type procedures, much like those that govern the conduct of a civil trial, and which also govern formal APA adjudications. Let's recall the different elements of these two types of procedure. Under Section 553, there must be notice in the Federal Register of a proposed rulemaking, there must be an opportunity for public comment. A final rule, if any emerges, must include a statement of its basis and purpose. There must be a 30-day period before final rules become effective, and judicial review is conducted under the arbitrary capricious standard. Contrastingly, under Sections 556-557, there is to be notice to the parties it may be in the Federal Register, too, but it must include the parties. Impartial presiding official, uh, who was impartial, that is, uh, uh, there's to be no ex parte contact with the presiding official. The presiding official may issue subpoenas, may make evidentiary rulings, may receive oral testimony, 
cross-examination and a rebuttal will be available to a party. A decision is to be made on an exclusive record developed at the hearing, and judicial review is under the substantial evidence standard. There's nothing really slippery about it, but mistakes happen. For example, the Overton Park opinion states that the substantial evidence test is authorized only when the agency action is taken pursuant to a rulemaking provision of the APA itself, Section 553, or when the agency action is based on a public adjudicatory hearing under Sections 556 and 557. This erroneous dictum was later corrected, but as we shall see, courts have been tempted to blend the two APA types deliberately into what have been called judicial hybrid rulemaking procedures. We will want to be on guard against doing that ourselves. We learned from Wyman Gordon that when they rulemake, agencies should follow Section 553 notice and comment procedures. At least, they should unless there is an APA exception. How can we tell when and whether an agency is supposed to rulemake by following sections 556, 557 on the record procedures instead? The trial-like process APA sections 556, 557 define is cumbersome and time-consuming, especially when the issue is not the concrete one of who did what, when, where, and how, as it would be in an adjudicative context. In the 1960s, the FDA experimented with formal rulemaking, but found it wasteful and repetitive. One of these formal rulemakings, our casebook tells us, had to do with the standard of identity for peanut butter. This one proceeding developed a transcript of over 7,700 pages, largely directed to the question whether the product peanut butter should consist of 90% peanuts or 87.5% peanuts. Imagine sitting through that. Recently, bills to require that all rulemaking follow formal procedures have been pending in the House of Representatives. The idea behind them seems to be an intention to cripple the agencies and to make it impossible to regulate. Obviously, regulated parties would welcome the opportunity to challenge burdensome rules on the ground that the agency failed to follow formal rulemaking procedures. When are the agencies required to do that? Section 553 Rulemaking tells us, When rules are required by statute to be made on the record after opportunity for agency hearing, Sections 556 and 557 of this title apply instead of this subsection required by statute, that is, when Congress says so. When is that? In U.S. v. Allegheny Ludlam and U.S. v. Florida East Coast Railway, the U.S. Supreme Court made it clear that the words record and hearing in a statute are not necessarily enough. The court wrote, We have recognized that the actual words on the record and after hearing used in Section 553 were not words of art words of art, or put differently, the court is telling us that the words hearing and on the record are not necessarily magic words. But the court leaves the distinct impression that absent these words, the court will be unable to discern a congressional intention to require that sections 556 and 557 be followed instead of section 553. It is also worth noting that this applies both to rulemaking, and to adjudication. Section 553 says, When rules are required by statute to be made on the record after opportunity for agency hearing, Sections 556 and 557 of this title apply instead of Section 553. Section 554 states, This section applies in every case of adjudication required by statute to be determined on the record after opportunity for an agency hearing. The agency shall give all interested parties opportunity for hearing and decision on notice and in accordance with sections 556 and 557. Although some of the federal circuits have read APA section 554 to state a presumption in favor of formal adjudication, the U.S. Supreme Court has never had occasion to decide. 
bear in mind that adjudicatory processes must be consistent with Londoner versus Denver. So the circuit court's presumption could be a way could be read as a way of to avoid having to decide a constitutional question. But again, the US Supreme Court has never weighed in on this interpretation of APA section 554. Putting it all together, we can draw this roadmap when we want to know whether formal APA Section 556-557 procedures are required of an agency, whether the action is a rulemaking or an adjudication. The gateway question is, does the statute use the terms on the record and hearing in a connected way? If the answer is yes, then if those terms pertain to issuing orders, formal adjudication is required. And if they pertain to making rules, formal rulemaking is required. If the answer is no, then Section 553 applies to rulemaking. No particular procedural format applies to informal adjudication, but Sections 552 and 555 have to be complied with. Again, the key words are required by statute on the record after opportunity for agency hearing. Required by statute. Courts aren't supposed to make this up. Congress does. When we get to our Vermont Yankee case, we will see how seriously the Supreme Court takes this.